uh, it's the first of this term's visual cultures public program. Um, and I'm delighted, absolutely delighted to have our uh, speaker here today, uh, Peter Wolfendale. Um, I'm not going to say too much about Peter except to say that he's got a uh, postdoc in the University of Johannesburg and he's going to be going there in June or July, so actually we're, we're really looking to have him before he leaves the UK. Uh, and congratulations on that. Um, you probably know Peter from his book, uh, Object Oriented Philosophy, The New Norms, New Clothes, that was published by Urbanomic. Um, I first came across Peter actually in the University of Warwick, where he did his uh, PhD. I remember going to a, a do a seminar on what's philosophy actually, mm -hmm. You, of course, asked the most difficult question. Um, and I, I also say that kind of since then I've, I've sort of seen Pete do talks in different places. Um, for example, being Skyped into Enclave, actually, for the Accelerationist book launch, and then most recently at the Baltic, sort of thing on rationalism and art. And what characterises these kind of expositions is the clarity with which you can lay out difficult conceptual materials, actually, kind of lay out different concepts and different systems of thought. It's really uh, quite incredible. And these tend to build, they're deceptively simple, they tend to build and build and build. Um, I also wanted to say that um, along, I think, with um, Reza Stein and Ray Brazier, I think Pete is probably uh, one of the key, and certainly most, one of the most eloquent spokespersons or philosophical spokespersons for accelerationism and for this renewed Prometheanism that we see. So it's particularly pleasing that he's here tonight to talk about Prometheanism and uh, rationalism. And people talk for about 50 minutes to an hour and then I'll chair a discussion. We'll chair some questions on this. So please join me in welcoming uh, people from there. Thank you. 
disrupting the balance between labour and capital, and threatening a feared shift in global capitalism. And finally, we have the dehumanisation of the human itself. The rapid development and increasing accessibility of technologies have modified human biology, psychology and sociality, spearheaded by the so-called MBIC convergence. So this is uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology and cognitive science threatens to dissolve the cognitive, reproductive and evolutionary unity of our current form of life, a common form of life. Now, the sheer causal complexities, complexity of these tendencies has so far made them easy to ignore. But their continuing escalation will produce future shock on multiple fronts. Ecological disasters, professional extinctions, and ramifying dysphoria. However it turns out, the future will not be more of the same. And we will be forced to face this fact whether we like it or not. This means that we have to reconstruct our horizon of expectations. The crucial question is whether we can do so in line with an, an egalitarian commitment to collective emancipation. Now, while these escalating tendencies confront us with possible discontinuities between, past, between the present and the future, they do not determine a single possible future, let alone an unconditionally better one. It is not just that the catastrophic transitions they portend to multiple possible outcomes, so, for example, accelerating automation could equally end in neo-feudalism, luxury communism, or cyberpunk dystopia, but rather that they interact and conflict with one another. So, give a, a most extreme example, the eradication of biological life on Earth is likely to evolve to any nascent artificial superintelligence. This means that we can no more return to the grand narrative of progress than we can remain in the end of history. If we are committed to an egalitarian politics, then this leaves us with three options for reconstructing our relations. First of all, fatalism. We reject our historical agency, resign ourselves to the worst possible outcome, and commit to a politics of amelioration. We simply try and make better what we can while admitting that we, we essentially have no control over the grand arc of history. Secondly, messianism. We reject our historical agency as well, but we cultivate a hope for the best possible outcomes and commit to a politics of anticipation. We hope for the best, and we engage in a sort of ritualistic politics that embodies that hope. Um, third, Prometheanism. We embrace our historical agency, investigate the tendencies and their possible outcomes, and we commit to a politics of innovation. So we, we actually aim to intervene in the transition between present and future. How we to assess these options? It should be clear that Prometheanism constitutes the most radical break with the horizon of capitalist realism. The alternatives preserve di different elements of its suppression of the future. So fatalism overcomes our collective inability to imagine the future, only to, to consolidate limits on political planning. Whereas Messianism converts this inability into an eschatological vision of an unimaginable future, in order to replace political planning with political ritual. Prometheanism alone sees the transition between present and future as a site of political contestation. Given this, the question becomes, what reasons could there be to reject Prometheanism in favour of fatalism or messianism? The Promethean affinity for technology provides the most obvious source of criticism. Each of the tendencies we are considering is intimately connected to the uncontrolled proliferation of technologies and their ramifications. However, insofar as Prometheanism is committed to technological control, it is entirely possible to dispute the use of any given technology from within the Promethean perspective. The most powerful source of anti-Prometheanism is thus to be found not in the rejection of any particular technological solution, but in more general critiques of technology, articulated in terms of the forms of thought and act thought and action that define it. For some, any problems associated with uncontrolled technological proliferation are inevitable consequences of the drive for technological control that Prometheanism exemplifies. 
and so cannot be solved by it. For others, any solutions that depend upon collective control are essentially complicit in the systems of domination that collective emancipation opposes, and so cannot be, cannot be egalitarian. These critiques come in many forms, from Heidegger's critique of technological untraining and Adorno's critique of instrumental rationality, to post-structuralist, post-modernist, and post-colonial critiques of the legacy of the Enlightenment. It's not possible to address all of these critiques individually here. However, they can still be usefully analyzed in terms of the way that they motivate fatalism and messianism. So, the essence of, fa of fatalism is skepticism about our capacity for action. It allows that we can understand our fate, but denies that we can change it for the better. By contrast, the essence of messianism is skepticism about our capacity for understanding. It denies that we can understand our fate, and thereby affirms that it may be better than we predict. If such skepticism is motivated by a general critique of our capacity, then it must be driven by worries about reason. The former is driven by worries about practical reason, or our general ability to use our understanding of the world to change it. The latter is driven by deeper worries about theoretical reason, or, ge or our general ability to understand the world in the first place. This means that any comprehensive defense of Prometheanism must include a defense of rationalism. Now, I don't aim to provide such a comprehensive defense in this paper, but simply to lay the groundwork for one. So I'm, I'm not going to give a, a completely solid defense of Prometheanism against all possible objections like this, but rather to explain the relationship between Prometheanism and rationalism in such a way that we can understand what the layout of, of the debate is and where such defenses would come from. So, um, I'm going to do this by first engaging with uh, the mythological <coughs> origins of Prometheanism, um, that uh, it's, it's kind of birthed within the Enlightenment, um, and then I'll, I'll proceed to talk about um, contemporary forms of Prometheanism, specifically left accelerationism and xenofeminism, um, how these draw on rationalist ideas and then explain um, the, the account of reason that contemporary rationalism is providing these, these positions. So, without further ado, myth. Oh, sorry. First of all, if we were to explore the relation between Prometheanism and rationalism, then we must explain each position on its own terms. Let's begin with a provisional definition of Prometheanism taken from Ray Brassier. So, Prometheanism is the rejection of predetermined limits upon action and self-transformation. And this suggests a similar definition of rationalism. The rejection of predetermined limits upon thought and self-understanding. Now, the parallel between these definitions then suggests an obvious connection between the two. If action is constrained by thought and self-transformation is constrained by self-understanding, then the rejection of limits on one implies the rejection of limits on the other. Therefore, Prometheanism entails rationalism. However, there is more to each position than these provisional definitions suggest, and more to their connection than this simple entailing. What constitutes a predetermined limit in these cases? That's the kind of crucial question. What we mean by a predetermined limit in either of these definitions? This crucial question is best answered by returning to the mythic origins of Western thought and showing how the birth of Prometheanism and rationalism during the Enlightenment responds to these myths. So, now we're going to. The foundational myths that establish the relation between humanity and nature in the Western tradition are the Abrahamic myth of the fall of man and the Greek myth of Prometheus' death to fire from the gods. Both <coughs> myths describe a prelapsarian state wherein all living things have a prescribed role in the order of nature, as represented by the divine will, but as one God among us. The origin of humanity in each case has two modes: a mode of creation, 
of nearly one animal within the natural order, albeit with a distinctive quality such as a positive resemblance to the divine or a negative absence of innate animal capacities. And then a moment of rupture as humanity is wrenched from this order, won't be related to it in any way. In the myth of the fall, it is the acquisition of theoretical knowledge that wrenches humans from the natural order. Insofar as it is through understanding this order that it becomes possible to transgress it. In the myth of Prometheus, it is the acquisition of practical knowledge that wrenches humans from the natural order, insofar as it enables them to subvert this order and to carve out their own place within it. <coughs> the expulsion from Eden and the torment of Prometheus essentially serve to foreshadow the dangers of this knowledge. Now, the legacy of these myths consists in the way that they frame the opposition between freedom and necessity. To understand this, it's important to make a distinction between causal necessity and normative necessity. So, between the way things must be and the way they ought to be. And this is precisely because the myths systematically conflate the two. Right? So, the myth of the fall actually invokes normative necessity to separate human freedom from causal necessity. So, the po the, it's the possibility of transgressing the moral order that presupposes free will. Um, and this is understood as independence from the causal order. By contrast, the myth of Prometheus describes the opposition between human freedom and causal necessity as an ongoing struggle. The subversion of the natural order is a process of empowerment in which we circumvent causal necessities by expanding our causal the theological foundation of each myth is the notion that the relation between freedom and necessity is itself circumscribed by the role that humanity plays within the natural world. So this is, this is how the rupture in each myth is reincorporated, as it turns out that, that the rupture itself is circumscribed by the order of nature. Um, and what this does is to establish freedom as a gift that is given to humanity which comes with certain, certain, con uh, certain causal constraints on possible action and certain normative constraints on permissible action. Now, it's the structure of this gift that produces a systematic ambiguity between causal and normative constraints. This ambiguity is an essential component of the notion of nature in the, in the Western tradition, and it's the ideological foundation of the predetermined limits that Prometheanism and rationalism reject. The ambiguity enables two rationalizing dynamics that shape our historical consciousness. So um, these are what I've called inertial rationalization and reactive rationalization. So inertial rationalization is the gradual interpretation of social norms governing historically stable societies as causal conditions of human survival, or the conversion of social equilibrium in a natural equilibrium. Reactive rationalization, on the other hand, is the sudden interpretation of constraints on what we can do as constraints on what we should do once these constraints have been overcome, or the conversion of empowerment in a transgression. Um, we give many examples of these dynamics in action, and even operating in succession. So the naturalization of heterosexual monogamy and the denunciation of reproductive technologies such as contraception and artificial insemination are a case in point. That's an example of, of inertial rationalization followed by reactive rationalization. However, it's more important to see the role these dynamics play in the constitution and exercise of social authority in the form of tradition and religion. So roughly, these correspond to <coughs> the authority the, the authority of tradition and the authority of religion. It's a more complicated story you can tell that, but it roughly works. <coughs> the basis of the Enlightenment is the rejection of these modes of authority. And it's here that Prometheanism is born, even if it's Romanticism that makes Prometheus the stand for freedom against the will of Zeus, the symbol of this collective. So, crucially, Prometheanism, as Prometheanism, embodied by the figure of Prometheus, is, uh, is 
is really a, 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 a consequence of, of, of the Romantic period. But the, the fundamental ideas which forge the notion of collector emancipation that is then symbolized are formed in Okay. The Enlightenment. Now, the history of the Enlightenment is rich, complex, and controversial. And I have no choice but to simplify it drastically. Uh, I'll focus on Jonathan Israel's distinction between the radical and moderate strands of the Enlightenment, represented by the uncompromising rationalism of Spinoza and the more, the more cautious empiricism of Locke. The crucial epistemological disagreement between rationalism and empiricism concerns the relative priority of inferential and experiential components of thought and their relative contribution to our knowledge. Rationalism has historically made bold the metaphysical claims of our reality, following lines of reasoning that carry it beyond the bounds of experience. While empiricism has done its best to police these boundaries. However, much as the rationalism of Descartes worked to reinvent Christian theology, the empiricism of Locke worked to preserve it from the more radical rationalism of Spinoza and his inheritance. This covert defense of religious fear was eventually formalized in Kant's transcendental synthesis of empiricism and rationalism. It's this which exemplifies the modus operandi of the moderate strand, the conservation of certain forms of traditional and religious authority in the face of radical critique. However, it is important to explain how the epistemological considerations motivating moderation in the theoretical sphere in, in the, the domain of metaphysics, come to motivate moderation in the practical sphere of the main politics. So, the political radicalism of Spinoza's thought <coughs> lies in its evisceration of the mythic le legacy of the Western tradition. On the one hand, he strips nature of all norm of necessity. There is no transgression, only empowerment. On the other, he dissolves the opposition between human freedom and causal necessity. There is no free will only acting in accordance with one's own essence. Freedom is causal power and causal autonomy, and it is given by nothing to no one. Politics is then dedicated to designing a society to, maxify, to maximize this freedom, and it is beholden to neither tradition nor religion. It's not until Goethe that Spinoza will be linked to the figure of Prometheus, for he is clearly Prometheus. By contrast, the political liberalism of Locke is founded on an appeal to natural rights to life, liberty, and property. These rights place normative constraints on the exercise of political power um, over individuals, curtailing traditional and religious authority to some extent. But, it has, but as has become clear in the intervening century, precisely how these rights limit the exercise of power, and precisely who possesses them, can be highly arbitrary. The fact that freedom remains a gift permits rationalization of the traditional power of landowners and the subhuman status of women, slaves, and colonists. What does any of this have to do with epistemology? In short, it is the ineffability of the gift that protects rationalization from reason. It is extremely important to understand this theological residue the proliferation of political liberalism is associated with the rise of secularism in the West, and so we must explain how its ineffability is compatible with institutional agnosticism. The crucial point is that one can be actively indifferent to what gives the gift without being indifferent to what is given. We can be both thoroughly agnostic about the divine principle within nature, so God, and hopelessly gnostic about the divine spark within the Political liberalism remains committed to a notion of liber liberty founded on the independence of free will from the causal order. It is a normative framework that begins with choice and systematically ignores the causal conditions that enable choice. It is a demand for freedom that refuses to understand what freedom is. The consequence is a botched universalism, in which what it is to be a free agent 
is implicitly indexed to a series of supposedly unmarked particulars. As the process of stripping away contingent characteristics halts at the edge of what it knows, the white, the male, the heterosexual, bourgeois, cis, etc. However, it's here that classical rationalism also falls. Its rejection of predetermined limits upon thought undermines its rejection of predetermined limits upon self-understanding. Its commitment to engaging with reason on its own terms, following lines of reasoning wherever they may lead, tends to obscure the causal conditions that enable such reasoning. This is no more, nowhere more evident than in Descartes, where the purported self-evidence of the cogitor conceals an unanalyzed and unanalyzable thinking substance. This makes what it is to be a knowing subject as easily indexed to unmarked particulars as what it is for it to be a free agent. This is a criticism that even Spinoza cannot fully avoid. The obvious connection outlined earlier means that this flaw in classical rationalism undermines classical Prometheanism. If we cannot understand the causal constraints upon reasoning, then how can we overcome Right, that's the end of the written part of the talk. Um, from here on in, I'm going to try and uh, 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 let the, 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 the PowerPoint presentation guide me, and hopefully it will, hopefully it will all make sense. Um, the, what I've explained so far is the connection between, so roughly what Prometheanism and rationalism are, um, roughly what they are in their classical forms, and what the connection between them is in these classical uh, what I want to move into now is what makes contemporary Prometheanism and contemporary rationalism different, and, and, and what is the connection between them. And uh, I'm going to do this by looking at two particular forms of contemporary Prometheanism. Right. Um, 25 minutes in, so I'm at halfway. Okay. So, first of all, um, left accelerationism. Um, this is obviously position that comes out of um, Nick Sernick and Alex Williams' uh, Manifesto for Accelerationist Politics, developed in various other places, and uh, crucial ideas developed in their more recent book, Inventing the Future, though without the word acceleration in the fact. Um, here is what I take to be a statement of the core idea, right? The insistence that the transition between capitalism and post-capitalism should be understood in the same terms as the transition between feudalism and capitalism, namely, as a complex process that can and should be accelerated, rather than as a radical break in the horizon of thought and action. Uh, so this, uh, crucially, of the tendencies that I presented at the beginning, this focuses on tendency number two, the dehumanization of the economy, um, accelerating automation and post work politics. Uh, there are various slogans, slogans and sort of uh, aesthetic images which are associated with this that I've put at the bottom. Um, Crucially, the idea that there's no going backwards, that um, fundamentally we can't return to pre-lapsarian states, be there some mythical sort of like delightful pre-capitalist history, or uh, you know um, post-1945 social uh, social democracy. Um, um, but crucially, um, you can see why this is prom Promethean in the way I've defined it, insofar as it's precisely about taking the transition between the present and the future as a point of contestation. And this means finding elements um, which will constitute a post-capitalist <laughs> system within the current phase of capitalism and try to encourage and cultivate them to facilitate the transition we want. Um, which has, we can, we can identify pre-capitalist formations that form the basis of, of, of the transition. Right. Okay. Um, so, what is the background to which left acceleration is rea reacting? Crucially, um, it's reacting to contemporary political liberalism. Right. So it's re reacting to the legacy of the modern enlightenment. Um, um, and the, the legacy of political liberalism is a kind of large ideological formation. Right? I think the, the, the basic conceptual ideas of liberalism I put forward, specifically about free will, still hold, 
but they're, they're more of a background than an explicit position. There are, however, explicit forms that um, liberalism takes. And so I've got two here. Um, and crucially, what, what unites all this stuff is that they, they essentially think about politics in terms of negative freedom and formal freedom. So um, I think that Kantian liberalism, which is sort of roughly what you'd associate with like Rawls and Habermas, and neoliberalism, which is sort of what you'd associate with Hayek Hay 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 and Fried um, Milton Friedman. Um, and the, um, the important thing to say before I talk about this a bit more is what I mean by neoliberalism here is actually the explicit ideology rather than talking about the wider sort of situational neoliberal with capitalism. Right? Um, there is an explicit ideology you can identify and it is a form of liberalism. Right, let, let's explain why. So, um, interestingly, both of these forms of liberalism are associated with a certain kind of rationality and a privileging of, of this kind of rationality. So, Kantian liberalism tends to think about things in terms of communicative rationality. Right. Um, so the the the, the, freed, the kind of freedom it's most interested in, as its ideal, right, is the uh, discursive freedom. Right. Um, the the atoms within the Kantian sort of picture of society are free discursive agents who were able to engage in uh, in discourse without um, without suffering constraint. Right. And so the the kind of crucial idea. Of, of the social sphere is as the public sphere of discourse, right? Um, there's differences between Rawls and Habermas here, but we could maybe discuss them elsewhere. By contrast, neoliberalism uh, is focused upon economic rationality, right? Um, again, this takes various different forms, but you'd be most familiar with the way this is thought about in terms of neoclassical economics, in terms of rational choice theory and preference maximization or homo economicus as, as the kind of atomistic individual constituting the social system. The freedom that is idealized is the freedom of contract, um, um, and the, the space of the public is, is essentially understood as the market. Right. Um, how does uh, left accelerationism agree and disagree with these things? So, crucially, it, it disagrees with both of them with regards to ends and means. Ends and means. But it has a, a certain amount of agreement with Kantian liberalism about ends and a certain amount of agreement with neoliberalism about means. What I mean by this is um, left accelerationism accepts that the ideal of uh, a society in which we can have a sort of uh, a public sphere in which we can engage in these sorts of symmetrical, um, um, egalitarian discourses is great. Um, it's just not the end of the story, and it's also not the situation we are actually in. Um, so, so, crucially, the, the problem with uh, the, the vision of politics given by Kantian liberalism is that it's essentially infected by this ideal. Um, um, uh, um, everything is understood in terms of, um, again, in terms of negative freedoms, in terms of things that constrain our capacity to engage in these kinds of free and open discourses, um, rather than thinking about the positive conditions that enable these things. And so, essentially, the, the most important power dynamics within these are, are, are ignored and forgotten. Um, and that, that basically uh, affects the vision of political action um, within this form of liberalism. By contrast, uh, what's interesting about neoliberalism in this view is that politics is not part of this ideal at all. In fact, the, the, the model of, of the market doesn't contain anything like political action. And so it's, it's ex, like, this, this plays out in the way in which neoliberalism as an ideology is spread and enacted. Right? Politics is always something other which is required to step up this situation. And if you read uh, Nick Alex's book, uh, they, they give a quite a thorough analysis and discussion of how uh, neoliberalism achieved hegemony and what we can learn from it. So that's their sort of interest in the means. Okay. Crucially, um, um, what he thinks both of these positions are missing is causal autonomy, or the causal conditions of autonomy. Um, 
I've already mentioned how this works in relation to Kantian liberalism, but I think the neoliberalism example is, is even better. So if you genuinely think that we are, or we can at least be accurately modeled by home economicists, that we are essentially preference maximizing machines, then um, more information is always better. Right? The market will always be better if there is more information and more options. Right? Um, if you take into account the conditions under which it is possible to make decisions, the fact that we have finite attention, uh, and just even if you just take into account the fact that we can have finite attention, right, this becomes completely different. Right? Beyond a certain point, information becomes noise. Right? Beyond a certain point, additional options actually become oppressive rather than liberate. Right? And so, um, it, if you're interested in, in cognitive liberation, you have to be interested in, in the, the, the causal conditions of rational autonomy. Right? The, the ability to make decisions, not really the ability to act. Right? So, um, am I doing time? Right, okay. Um, okay, so it's worth something I haven't said, it, it, most people are probably familiar with it, but just going back to negative freedom and formal freedom. Negative freedom is freedom, freedom from, right? Um, uh, freedom from external influence, right? Positive freedom is freedom to. Um, formal freedom is the kind of freedom you're given where you have the, you have a right, right? So like I have the right to buy a yacht, right? But I don't have the real freedom. I don't have the capacity to buy a yacht, right? And you can think about this formal freedom in terms of negative freedom because. It's essential, although it's the formal freedom is something that's actively established rather than sort of like passive, right? Like the state guarantees my formal right, right? It prevents anyone from, from um, interfering with me. Um, it's still fundamentally uh, a, a negative freedom. The state is not enabling me to, to actually carry out that right. Okay. Um, so, what what is required to get beyond this way of thinking about freedom within the liberal tradition, which is fundamentally the legacy of this image of free will as causal, as causal <laughs> independent, is this account of, of the causal conditions of agency, um, making decisions and act, acting. And I think this is what contemporary rationalism surprised. Um, so we'll, you can sort of break this down into two fundamental um, positive contributions. One is a notion of synthetic freedom, right? Which is, which is, if you want, the ideal, right? As opposed to uh, the ideal and liberalism being about guaranteeing non-interference, right? The ideal here is about is about enabling maximal um, uh, uh, maximal ability to act, right? And this is this idea of synthetic freedom. What we want is to is to understand the conditions of causal autonomy, autonomy, and then enhance them, right? Um, the second important contribution here, which is more on, more on the realm of means, right, is that this also gives you a way of thinking about collective agency. So if, if, if you have an account of individual agency, um, this can be extended in order to think about collective agency and thus what it would be to constitute something like uh, a political organisation capable of undertaking collective commitments and then enacting them, right? Now, what do you get if you take away uh, these uh, these rationalist uh, ideas? Right? What what do you get if you try and oppose um, liberalism in its various forms, um, but still want to retain an egalitarian perspective? Um, my claim is essentially you end up with voluntarism, um, and this um, this basically you, you you continue to think of of freedom in terms of free will which is fundamentally mysterious, right? But you valorize it in various ways. So one example of this is uh, insurrectionism, right? Collective agency is impossible to plan, it just kind of pops up and all you can do is hope for it to pop up at the right places, right? You just get a, a confluence of, of forces and boom, action happens. Um, or neo-animism, so various forms of new materialism and Jane Bennett's work. Uh, I've written about this in my book, I think it's disastrous. Okay. Um, so, moving on, um, xenofeminism. 
And I'll try and do this quicker so I can get to talking about contemporary rationalism. Right. Um, uh, obviously, this comes out of the Zika Feminist Manifesto, um, but you can you can relate it to all sorts of other things. So here's my my boiling down of, of, of its essence. Right. It's the insistence that the artificiality of identity must be embraced, rejecting the givenness of material conditions, so sex and social forms like gender. Um, um, and harnessed as part of an exploratory program that progressively ramifies existing modes of selfhood and integrates them into a generic model of autonomy. Right? And this is focused on the third tendency I discussed, the dehumanization of the human, proliferation, proliferating technologies of selfhood and emancipation through alienation. That uh, second phrase, emancipation through alienation, maybe we can discuss that in, in, the, um, in the talk after. Um, I've also given a few slogans here. Mm -hmm. The crucial one being, and this is the end of the manifesto, and it's my favourite line: "If nature isn't just a change nature, <coughs> right? You can't get a better Promethean slogan than that." Um, what is the background uh, that content that xenofeminism uh, feminism is reacting to? Um, it's opposed to contemporary normative naturalism, so the other elements of um, sort of the moder the other legacy of the moderate enlightenment. So the the the, the implicit forms of normative naturalism that have remained within secular humanism. Um, and I've, I've marked these down as material reality and social reality. Uh, what I mean by this is um, the insistence on certain like extant material and social realities like biology like the biology of sex and the, the social structure of gender um, as providing intractable limits, um, which, which then lead, give us certain kinds of normative consequences. Um, I've broken this down into two of tendencies. Um, so one I call identity's essence. So you know this has, this contains various components: biology as destiny perversity is pathology and diagnostic selfhood. Um, and the examples of this I picked up are hashtag born this way and evil psychology. What I mean by the uh, born this way hashtag is um, the rationalization of things like uh, homosexuality as um, nature. So it's so reincorporating um, um, what has become a, uh, what was a, a kind of um, transgression into nature in order to, to, to um, overcome its transgressive character. Um, and this, of course, means that you, you kind of close the door after your particular form of transgression and prevent, prevent other kinds of perversity from being justified, justified as non-transgressive. Right? Uh, and fundamentally, the model of selfhood here is diagnostic. Um, if you think of the um, DSM-4 Right, uh, evil psychopath is, is another good example of this, which is ev evolutionary psychology. It just contains all of these horrible examples of people um, people naturalizing particular sorts of social forms and justifying them through evolutionary history. Um, just, just awful. Um, second tendency: uh, identity is authenticity. Uh, this is more hard to pin down, and I want to say explicitly, I didn't use the term identity. Because um, that's just so, such a fraught term that it's essentially useless. Um, um, but I kind of try to boil this down: a position as power, intersectionality as taxonomy, and situated selfhood. What I mean by this is seizing a part. So, so for instance, recognizing that a category like race is uh, not biological. So, denying the bi biological reality of race, yet asserting the social reality of race. And insisting that um, it pr presents constraints on forms in which one can self-identify, and this has to be has has to be not merely should be has to be seized upon um, as the only form for articulating forms of political resistance. And this this produces a, a, a kind of conception of intersectionality, which is uh, the like ramifying location of smaller and smaller static categories. Um, how does xenofeminism disagree with this? Well, fundamentally, it, it's not adverse to thinking about, say, biological sex 
and thinking about it in turn precisely because it's interested in te technologies itself. So like if if you're interested in uh, the the status of, of trans politics, right, you have to be interested in endocrinology, right? There's no right, you you've, you've got to seize upon realities you simply have to refuse their normative valence. Um, on the other hand, it, it tries to present a model of intersectionality as generosity, um, which is this idea of kind of a constant integration of various different forms of, 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 of different modes of identifying. Right. So, what does uh, contemporary rationalism supply to this? Um, I'm going to say, on the one hand, normative autonomy. Um, so it, it supplies an account of where normative force comes from, um, uh, which is it's essentially Kantian, right? You treat people as, as autonomous agents as anything themselves, right? And this means you do not permit any kind of justification of political action on the basis of nature, right? You have a positive alternative, right? Uh, but on the other hand, and this is kind of crucially related, it pre presents a mutable conception of self, where precisely what self is about is about how one uh, how one identifies and integrates one's kind of narrative history and actions in such a way that one 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 is not a fixed self but a kind of trajectory. Um, yeah, we can talk about that more later. What's the anti-rationalist egalitarian alternative to this? What, what do you get if you want egalitarianism? You, you want to completely reject these resources? Uh, my claim is you get Gnosticism. Um, you're back to Gnosticism. Um, basically, implicit theology comes back to the venue. Um, and if I was to give an example of this, I would say it's a sacralization of the body. So, um, the discourse of embodiment has various different um, uh, sides. Right, you will find it in uh, feminist theory, you will find it in cognitive science, you will find it in phenomenology, you will find it here, there and everywhere. And the word embodiment gets used as a kind of catch-all term that intersects across them. Um, uh, and one of the kind of uh, sort of lines of thought that leads to this is a kind of misreading of Foucault. So Foucault's later work is on about self-construction. Right, and, and this is very, very influential. Right, but if you read self-construction, if you read the fact that the self is constructed as um, the idea that the self is illusionary, then what you're left with is a return to the body as the site of the real. Right, and then, and crucially, this body is not um, the body as object of science. Right, it's not a point of scientific or technological intervention. It's the lived body. Right? And that lived body becomes the source, like the implicit source of normative judgment. And this, this basically replaces a, no, a, a, a notion of normative autonomy with the primacy of suffering as where all of all kind of normative theorizing comes from. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that this is really problematic. Right? But maybe, maybe you're not. But I think this is where the dialectic is. So, um, Contemporary rationalism. I've sort of basically said what rationalism provides to these, these two sides. Uh, in essence, it provides a, an account of what it is to be a rational agent, an annoying subject, right? One which is which is fundamentally uh, uh, amenable to, to uh, talking about the causal conditions of rationality, right? Uh, um, this is the crucial difference between classical rationalism and contemporary rationalism, or what some people call neo rationalism. Right. And if you want to think about it in, in, in kind of historical terms, really it's about the, ad, the advent of computation. Right. The emergence of computer science is what enables us to think about right, the actual implementation of reason within causal systems. And this is crucially about functionalism. Right. It enables you to think about um, rationality as like an abstract functional structure which, which is then implemented in a variety of different ways. Some better, some worse, but you know, some just entirely different, right? Um, so just like you can think about a, 
uh, a Turing machine, which is an ideal way of, of representing what a computer is, as being made out of a whole variety of different things, like uh, you could make it out of silicon chips, you could make it out of wheels and cogs, you could try and create one out of biological things if you wanted to, right? The idea is we think about rational agency in the same terms. It can be, it's, it's, you could think about humans as being rational agents, you could think about artificial intelligence as being rational agents, you could think about aliens as being rational agents, you could think about all sorts of stuff. As long as they realize the correct functional rules, you've got it, right? And this is why artificial intelligence is quite important for um, neo-rationalism at least, which is that it gives us a kind of uh, a, a stripped down research program for approaching this question of what is it to be a rational agent, independent of all these kinds of bizarre contingencies, because it's a positive. So it, instead of the, the classical rationalist approach of sort of trying to strip away contingencies and being left at the limit of our, our implicit, it gives us a kind of positive program for building up an account of what it is to be, be rational. So, um, yeah, I think I'm all right. Um, what is this account of, right? Um, well, crucially, uh, I've already sort of presented this split between theoretical and practical reasons, right? Um, and this isn't too hard, but you need both in order to be a rational agent. Um, and the idea is roughly uh, what it is to be a, 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 a rational agent from the theoretical perspective is to keep track of your, what you call your practical commitments, so your beliefs about the world. And that keeping track essentially involves inference. It essentially involves keeping track of what follows from what, what's incompatible with what, right? Um, like, the rational agent is to be capable of reasoning Practical reasoning then falls out of this, right? Um, in order to be able to be practically committed to um, realizing a certain state of affairs, you have to be able to understand what it would be for that state of affairs to hold. So, use a phrase from my later philosophy, like making true is uh, dependent upon taking true, right? Um, this can be finessed in more complicated ways, but again, both. Essentially, to be a rational agent, you have to both keep track of the way you think the world is, and you have to keep track of the way you think the world should be, right? Which includes your desires, but also your practical commitments to certain kinds of norms, like social norms or political ideals, right? Okay, and these two things are essentially interconnected. Okay, right. Another way of thinking about this, and perhaps a better way, um, is in terms of universality, right? What I mean by this is, so I, I basically think about what reason is at this abstract functional structure, and I think of it as a protocol, right, that can be implemented in various different ways, is the most general way of, of, of processing information, or, or rather, the only in principle universal way of processing what does that mean? Well, we've evolved various parochial ways of processing information about our environment, right? I have all this hardware built in my, or wetware, or, right, which has evolved to track moving objects you know, in three dimensions, to track um, faces, to track emotional information that those faces are giving me, um, and to solve certain environmental problems like how to find food and you know uh, uh, reproduce and things like this on the basis of that right um, these are the sorts of things that we share with animals we have these various different and crucially the vast majority of our cognition is based on this the vast majority of our cognition is just informational heuristics right um, um, when I say a reason is this in universal uh, information processing call, uh, what I mean by that is it's in principle extensible, right? It's the only system for processing information that in principle can incorporate any kind of information that we did not evolve to process, right? To deal with practical problems as well as theoretical things about what the environment is. Um, how to think about this? Uh, I want to describe it in terms of three levels. So information mm -hmm. integration, consciousness, self-consciousness, running up against the hour, but we'll be all right. Um, what, I, what I mean by information integration? So, um, think phenomenologically, right, for a second. 
Right. Uh, so imagine uh, you can you're in a situation where you can see a car driving across one part of your field of vision, right? But then it, it kind of disappears from your field of vision. It goes behind some trees or whatever. But then you can you can hear the Doppler effect going past you on this side, right? And your mind just seamlessly converts these two local kinds of data, which are heterogeneous, these are different kinds of data, right, into a single object, right? That is integration. That is the integration of and fusion of different types of data into a single global fusion, right? So this is about local to global transitions, right? Crucially, um, it's that kind of uh, integration, so this is, this is still at an evolved level I'm talking about, everything's evolved, but this is still at the level of the sorts of capacities we share around this, right? But crucially, this is the precondition of then attaching any other kind of data to that object. On the, basis of, on the basis of being able to integrate these kinds of information we've evolved the process, we can then listen and be like, ah, that, the engine on that car needs a tuner, right? And on that basis, we can infer various other things. So we're like, ah, I think that must be my friend's car, and that means that I should maybe buy this for their birthday, like in the voucher for a tuner. You, know, you, you, can, you can apply all kinds of different, different information that we did not evolve to, uh, to process on the basis of, of, of objects. Consciousness, self-consciousness, right? Um, uh, this is an idea from Kant, right? So Kant has what I take to be a really profound principle that there is no consciousness without the possibility of self-consciousness. And this is a good way of thinking about that fact I threw out earlier. Most of our cognition is heuristic, right? Um, what is it, nevertheless, that makes this uh, heuristic cognition ours? that makes it something that is actually part of our consciousness and actually part of uh, our process of reasoning and engaging with our environment. Right? Crucially, it's the possibility of it becoming self-conscious. And self-consciousness is understood in terms of this process of rational integration, where we can, in principle, apply any kinds of data we like through tagging things with concepts. Right? Uh, to give you a simple example, right? again, like, if I drive a car, right, everything I'm doing is, is purely kind of embodied coping with my environment, right? What makes that nevertheless uh, conscious is the possibility of interrupting it. The possibility of me going, wait a minute, how does this stand in relation to this, like, you know, uh, for any kind of piece of my environment points out? How does this stand in relation to my global picture of the environment given by all of the kinds of things I understand, right? My conceptual understanding of various things. Um, it's the possibility of integrating this and then using that to, to then feed back into action, right? Which is what makes it conscious or a kind of overall rationality. Right? So fundamentally, most of what we do is uh, the result of reasoning. What makes it rational, nevertheless, is that it has this fundamental connection to the possibility of reason, or reasoning. Okay, uh, finally, perspectival navigation. Um, and this is, perspectival navigation is the thing that enables uh, in principle extensibility. So I talked about this idea that in principle we can incorporate any kind of information, right? And basically, this is the level of the social, where, uh, and so this is, this is where communicative rationality actually comes back in. It's our ability to navigate between different perspectives, to understand the, the convergences and divergences between the different ways in which we map the world. And this means, crucially, not just our beliefs, but the concepts that we are using, right? That enables us to revise those beliefs and to revise those concepts. And it's conceptual revision, right, that enables this possibility of, of in principle extensibility. It's no limits in principle to our ability to revise our concepts and thus to what we can represent. Right? Um, this is why we can represent things that we have not evolved to represent, like electrons, justice, uh, systemic oppression, like there are all of capitalism, right? There are all of these things that we can represent and talk about and discuss <coughs> and act upon that 
involved kinds of information and thinking like we didn't evolve for. Right. Okay, that's what reason is, roughly. Right? It's very outlined, but crucial there. <laughs> what isn't reason? And this is the end of the talk. And this is sort of on the basis of doing all this stuff, I can now sort of preempt a bunch of common objections to rationalism. Right, so what isn't reason? First of all, it's not intellectual intuition. Right, this is the problem of classical rationalism. This idea that reason is about self-evidence. It's not. Right? If anything, um, reason is about um, uh, uh, undermining self-evidence. So uh, the, the best evidence, the best examples of this are all in mathematics, right? Where you know our our intuitions about how things should be are fundamentally challenged by series of deductions that show that they cannot possibly be that way. Right? Uh, Russell's paradox, for instance, in set theory. I won't go into it, but the reason it's a paradox isn't that it's a contradiction. It's that it just conflicts with the way in which we think we should be able to reason. We can't. We can't work that way. Right. Okay. Secondly, uh, deduction. Right. So I've just talked about mathematics. Right. But mathematics is pretty much the only place you will find pure deduction. Right. If what you think reasoning is is like absolutely exceptionless uh, reasoning from first principles, uh, then you're going to be disappointed. Right. Reasoning involves. Um, I mean, I, I again talk about technicalities here, but there are phenomena, phenomena like non-monotonicity or abductive reasoning, where crucially it's about reasoning with, exce with exceptions. Right? Drawing inferences that are kind of default. They're, they're good, but they're, they could potentially be undermined by information or factors that you, you aren't yet aware of. And you can't, and crucially, you can't specify what all of those factors are in advance. Some very interesting work on artificial intelligence about this. But anyway, right? So, not intellectual intuition, not deduction, perfection. Right? Uh, one of the common uh, objections I get to rationalism is, but people aren't rational. Right? So, there, done, QED. Um, uh, and, and crucially, like, uh, rationality is a norm. Right? And what that means is, you can fail to live up to it. Right? People, but there are there are things that we can't even say are irrational, right? Like any the possibility of irrationality depends upon a certain capacity for rationality, right? Um, uh, and what it is to be more rational and be better, uh, and not even to be more rational, just to continue to be rational, is to work through things like inconsistency. Like right? we all have inconsistent beliefs. Right, we all of us do, right? Uh, and we have inconsistent commitments, right? What it is to be rational is to try and find those commitments and revise them so that you get rid of your inconsistency, right? Fair enough, right? So no one's perfect, right? The important thing is to understand what the, the, the process of revision is. Okay, uh, yeah. Very, I've, I've got a couple things left to say. Preference maximization. This <coughs> is the the kind of rationality at the heart of the economic model that I was mentioning before, at the heart of neoliberalism. Uh, um, uh, basically, this isn't strictly false. Rational choice theory isn't strictly false. It just works under a really, really um, constrained set of assumptions. So what it gives you is a truncated conception of practical rationality. Crucially, like all uh, that uh, preference maximization or rational choice that he deals with is is desires, right? Uh, and people will try and reconstruct things like political commitments out of desires, right? But if, if that very activity is just is, is is just doomed to failure, right? You can't you can't get the rest of the, the space of practical reason, like collective reason, right? Uh, out of this, right? You've got to you've got to view out and, and look at practical rationality in a in a more broad way. Uh, final two things, um, disembodied, like, affectless, etc. So this comes back to the, the point about Marxism. Uh, a lot of people, especially people from affect theory, uh, an affect theory perspective will say that, um, like, um, uh, essentially this kind of model of cognition um, can't include affect or somehow denigrates it, right? Um, as I've tried to suggest, this kind of model incorporates embodied 
and cognition is largely embodied in heuristics, right? How do you think about affect in these terms, though, and mood and emotion, right? Um, now, the source of this sort of objection tends to be the fact that seeing that an emotional response is irrational is very offensive, um, right? Uh, it, and, it, and for good reason, right? But we might want to consider what are the conditions under which it's legitimate to be able to see an emotional response or uh, an emotional impulse you have yourself as a rational. There are two, basically. So one, one way of looking at this is in terms of effective cognition is a very, very useful heuristic for, um, for dealing with your motivations to act. Classic example is fear. Right? Your fear responses will make you act in certain ways that will be, for the most part, positive. They'll be in line with the way you want to act, right? Without having to go by a reasoning. If you had to go by a reasoning, right, you would be hit by the truck, right? Um, however, um, they can also produce impulses and responses that incline you to act in certain ways that go against your, your life projects, right? You can be afraid to move to another country, uh, and it'll, even though really it's what you want to do. This is what I'm doing right now. Um, right? So you, recognize that this response is, is in some, well, rather if you act upon that response, that action is in some sense of right. right? The second way of thinking about this is much more interesting, right? How about, right? I'll, I'll, I'll leave normalization hanging, right? But this is important. The second is more interesting. So here we're talking, of the, in the, the first, we're talking about how affect functions as a heuristic for your, uh, for dealing with your existing practical commitment. It's, it's, it's a means to an end, right? But affect, motivation, mood, these various cognitive mechanisms can just be the motivations themselves, right? Like, like your affection for friends and loved ones, right? Your anger at certain kind of injustices in the world. These can actually be the source of motivation rather than simply being means to an end for the other motivation. How can such things be irrational? Crucially, they can conflict. Right? So, simple example. You have two friends. You feel amazing affection for both of them. You're inclined to believe what both say. They have a dispute. You know, one of them has done something horrible, right? Um, and when you're with both of them, your inclinations are to support both of them, to support them, right? These are your local situations in your practical space, right? How do you integrate these into a global situation? You, you have to recognize that they're inconsistent and you have to just identify with one rather than the other, right? Um, and this is, this is the, the sort of um, part of the idea of normative autonomy and mutable selfhood that I was talking about in being a feminism is that um, part of being a self is about choosing which of your drives, which of your effective impulses to identify with and to con continue to cultivate and which ones you want to not identify with and try and suppress, right? Um, so it's, again, even in this case, it's about integration. Right? And normalization, I will just leave hanging. So there we are. That's, um, that's contemporary rationalism and that's connection there. Pretty good. And it's the idea of the self is so actually uh, an announcement of those links or kind of, you know, But there's also <coughs> implicit, a, different, a different kind of self. I mean, you touched on it just in your talk, but this, the self as a trajectory, this kind of self tra transformation. So I'm interested in that, you know, what is the relationship of a self to the community project? Do I need a mic or should I just go back here? Right? Can I ask you a quick, can I just supplementary thing to that is, um, and, and what I'm really interested in is whether there's a... What I'm really interested in is whether the, <laughs> whether the, um, the trajectory of the self, whether that kind of second notion of the self, which is self transformation or kind of go beyond the fixed self, whether that practice um, can purely be a kind of rational project. And I think in your sense, you know, that's what it can be. Um, but I'm wondering, I mean, uh, for example, the Foucault technology of the self yeah. I mean, I mean, I haven't looked at it for a while, but my understanding is there's all sorts of practices involved there from meditation, hypometer, conversation, friendship, but some of them are 
don't seem entirely based on reason and rationality. It, 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 in a way, I suppose my question is, can, are there, um, is there a way in which reason and rationality can also reinstate fixed notions as well? And one of Foucault's things is trying to kind of sidestep that thinking ego. So I, I suppose it's about the possibility of other kinds of practice beyond reason. Okay, well, um, so, start with Foucault, right? Uh, I'm a Foucauldian, I love Foucault. Right. I, just, I just embrace the Kantian bit of Foucault that a lot of people ignore. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's more, more Kantian than Nietzsche. Right? Um, and this comes across, I think, in the technology of the self stuff, where a lot of people will talk about Foucault. Foucault is all about this multiplicity of different kinds of subjectivity. And yeah, he is, but he describes the transcendental structure of those forms. It gives you the form of forms of subjectivity, right? Um, the interesting thing for me is to understand that form, right? right? Yeah. Um, and uh, how does this relate to, so the, the gap you identified is what you might want to call the gap between your model of yourself as you are and mm -hmm. your ideal self, yeah. who you want to be, yeah. right? And that is, I, I think, crucially, um, well, one, I think it's where all the deep magic is, mm. right? Uh, but I think it's it's not as it, it's very complicated. I think there's a real mm. sort of intertwining of these two things. Mm. Um, but I, as for like rational and irrational practices, mm. right? I think a lot of the stuff that you would think is irrational, mm -hmm. I would, I would. Well, it's it's not that it's 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 rational in the sense of like, oh, it, it's actually engaging in performing chains of reasoning. I just say no. It, it's just it's just engaged in the process of constituting something like uh, uh, an ideal self-image, and mm -hmm. like there's, I I I I'm, I think that I don't think any of that stuff is irrational. But even if even if some of those uh, constitute that kind of ideal self-image, and I've got an idea of where I want to go, even if some of the strategies I've got to put in place are kind of irrational, some kind of becoming a certain place <coughs> of myself in, well, it means a slightly kind of I, I, look, I, I think there's a fundamental element of contingency right. at the core of the self that you can't get rid of. There's a certain, and this is this is the final remnant of the kind of the idea of free will that I, I, I don't I don't want to elaborate on too much. But crucially, the where the trajectory comes from mm. is fundamentally ungrounded, mm. right? What is what is rational is the process of its evolution, mm. or what what can be rational. Um, and I, yeah, so what's, what's interesting is just trying to understand in the most abstract terms you can, mm -hmm. like, what that evolution is. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is very important because this is a crucial question of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. How do we make artificial general intelligences mm -hmm. that are autonomous, mm -hmm. right, that we haven't just uh, made into automatons, mm -hmm. right, that we haven't just fixed their desires and what they want to do, and they, they just run off on those. How do we create? And in, in, in answering that question, we actually figure out who we are and what we are and, and what it is for us to be autonomous. Oh, the question. Uh, the, mic, the mic can't work. So speak up. Yeah, yeah, speak up. Okay, so I've got one question here, one question here. So one down here, and one up there. Um, okay, I, I tried to ask this in return. Um, I, I Thank <laughs> you. 
three things. First of all, just a preliminary thing. So, like, because I talk about the Prometheus myth here and myth in the fall, like, it, it's important to sort of say that, like, like, precisely what Prometheanism is here is actually kind of like a reaction against the mythic. But it's like a use, and it, like, in the Romantic theory, it's a, it's a use of the mythic against the mythic. Right? So there's a, there's, there's a, there's a certain kind of, like, tension there. You know, and like, well, do we, do we, can we not get rid of our myths? Can we not get rid of myth, myth, mythology? Or rather, can we, through an effort of Prometheanism, actually extract Prometheanism from Prometheus himself, right? Um, I think that's a tension that, that's, that's uh, worth exploring further. And it does come into this question of hyperstition as a concept. I think that concept is basically to do with the gap that I was talking about Simon about. Uh, there's a gap between the, our conception of ourselves as we are and our conception of ourselves as we would like to be, right? And um, I think uh, hyperstition helps, gives us, it gives us ways of practically engaging with gaps like that. Um, and so it's, it's not just about our collective vision of the future, but also about our collective and individual visions of ourselves. It, interesting if I add one point to that. You know, I, I talk about how this conception of individual agency gives you a model of, set of, of collective agency. One of the interesting consequences of that is it implies some idea of collective selfhood. Like if, if you're talking about a collective that is autonomous, right, this seems to imply that there's some notion of selfhood that you're thinking about here. Radically different from our particular form of individual selfhood, right? But it means that, uh, you know, this is going to be a place where questions of hyperstition are crucially involved in the idea of constituting a, a, a vision of what a, a collective wants to be and thus driving its tra trajectory to evolution. Right. Um, finally, about the hyperstition film, I, I don't know, but, uh, um, I really enjoyed this in school. And the notion of navigation is still, is still implicated. Like when I was talking about all the, these, these, these ideas of integration and transversing between local and global, um, these are really deep ideas that I started to explore at that summer school, and I would like to continue to explore them in depth. Um, it's taken me like two years to understand what Reza Negrostani is talking about in terms of sheaf theory. It's like, sheaves, they're incredibly important. And it's like, okay, I'll take your word for it. It's taken me two years digging through mathematics that I didn't quite understand. And now I'm like, yes, I understand local, global. This is the important conceptual framework for thinking about this. Uh, so to do more of that would be great, um, but I'll, yeah, if you can hyperstition and generate a 2026 conference, I'm okay. Uh, I've got a question, so if you, if you ask questions. Um, what would you say, would you say there's any kind of gaps or difficulties in the kind of progression between an epistemological acceleration of progress, say, right near rationalism, and a political There are different projects pursuing different things. Here is how they're connected, but it's not like they collapse necessarily. And crucially, like, like there are theoretical interests here. Like, I'm sort of interested in talking about artificial intelligence and all this, this sort of stuff, right? Uh, and there are political and practical interests, and there are other people going to be doing that. And how do you interface these things when both of these projects are provisional and still on, ongoing, right? Um, so, like, I, I do not have a complete model. Like, I'm talking about this idea of a functionalist account of, of what it is to be rational. I don't have a complete account of that. If I did, I would have a recipe for artificial general intelligence, and I would now be very, very wealthy. Um, I don't. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an epistemological project which is carrying on, right? How, but, uh, but, you know, it's got outlines, and crucially those outlines connect to, to political projects. How do you maintain those political projects and the basis of those outlines when they start being filled in? 
crucially, you have to have this notion of revisability, this idea of, of kind of like generic universality, which has a certain negative component. That is this like our ongoing process of, of trying to, but crucially, unlike what I was talking about in terms of like classical rationalism and classical liberalism, it's not just that negative process of trying to strip away a contingency. Because if you just have that, you, you end up leaning on your implicit conception. So crucially, this is what I have against like Gnosticism and voluntarism is like they refuse any kind of explicit account of what freedom is. But when you do that, all you're left is with, with an implicit one. Like you're left falling back on um, precisely the sort of stuff that like the literature in affect theory about implicit implicit bias and things like that is is, is grabbing really really importantly. Like you can't simply have the explicit you've got to have this so the implicit, you've got to have this well it's to say it's it's this ongoing revisionary project is to say it's an ongoing process of explicitation. Like you're on ongoing process of trying to make explicit and develop um, an account of freedom and what it is. And and and, th and how we how we apply that um, um, in political logic. Right, does that, that make sense? Cool. Can I, uh, can I just take this question about kind of um, focus issues just for a minute? If anybody else wants to leave then, I don't want to let Simon monopolise me. Let <laughs> me ask one more question then. But I've just come reminded with Ray Bradley's kind of um, essay on accelerationism, it kind of ends up with kind of J.T. Ballard. It's kind of this curious thing, it's kind of laid out with this kind of, you know, um, heresy against the alternative that's given to the main author. It's Ballard that provides these conceptual persona and these kind of figures that live this kind of different Promethean life. And, and I, I suppose it's like taking this question of the way that fiction, or I think Bradley talks about it in terms of the imagination or imagination, has to go hand in hand with reason. Right? In a way, reason without the imagination, without these images that Ballard provides, is kind of moribund. Uh, just as the imagination without reason has got any of the techniques to get there. Um, um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so, two points there. So, uh, in fact, let me skip ahead to uh, the end of the, the talk. Uh, if it'll let me. Where the hell is it? Where is my. Uh, uh, it insists on, on taking time to transition. She's silly. Um, um, Right, this is what I wanted. So, I try to talk about universality in terms of these three layers, information, integration, consciousness, self-consciousness, perspective, and application. Anybody who's familiar with uh, German idealism, right, this is imagination, understanding, reason. Right, uh, I mean that in the, like, the Hegelian sense. So Hegel will talk about the relation between understanding and reason, and crucially he says, you know, understanding is one-sided, reason is the thing that enables it to break its one-sidedness. Right, uh, this is the the model here. But cruci crucially, right, um, like imagination has an important role there. Right, without without imagination, you do not have the basis on which to engage in your project of integration and revision. Right, and uh, another way of talking about this is in terms of what I was saying about deduction. Like reason isn't deduction. Like the reason it isn't deduction is that uh, it fundamentally requires a kind of creative element that cannot be removed. The, the difficulty is not thinking of that creative element as some kind of upswell of like radical creative force. Like that's an image we have in, in a lot of kind of Western thought that is just poisonous. You have to think about, about reason and creativity as being fundamentally connected. But that means thinking about reason and imagination as being fundamentally connected. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know my kind of head goes like that, but if we're, if we're, if we're kind of disintegration of that kind of the, the imagination, are there certain figures that kind of disrupt that kind of Hell yeah. integration? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Then, you know, so that yeah. seems to me crucial in terms of this project of getting this but, but, but that is that is precisely what why Hegel thinks you need reason as well as understanding, right? Is that like the research like there are points where you find different kinds of, of, of local ways of thinking about things mm -hmm. that you can't fit together. Mm -hmm. Right? What what do you do when you get that? Well the only thing you can do is revise them. Somehow these things have to change 
in order to think about how they fit together. So this is how the process of, of revising contradictions leads to conceptual change. And that kind of conceptual change can come right from the bottom. It can come from uh, like imaginative disruption, inability to think in, in terms of certain classical imaginative. That happens in mathematics. Like you find, like, the, the, but you always use the, the example of a, a curve that has no tangent. Right? I cannot visualize that. That's like totally, radically alien. Right? Um, and there are, there are examples. Of it, anyway. Sorry. Um, Completely 
which are something else. And, and specifically, I would like to ask you, how do you see that within the computational paradigm? Really good question. Okay, so, um, so, um, like, the classical Kantian conceptional theoretical practical reason is this, this hard dependence of practical reason and theoretical reason. You need theoretical reason to have practical reason, mm -hmm. right? And the bad, this can lead to bad ways of thinking about action, mm -hmm. as if every action has to result from going through practical syllogisms, right? Uh, the story I told about consciousness and self-consciousness is a way of kind of mitigating that, mm -hmm. of, of, of recognizing that actually this isn't how action works. If that's the case, if you can mitigate that hard conception of the relation between theoretical and practical reason, mm -hmm. um, how, how should you think about this in functional terms and what are the consequences? Um, the crucial point for me right, is that there are, so I, 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 I put this in terms of like making true, right, being able to act and produce a certain state of affairs in the world is sort of uh, dependent upon taking true, being able to recognize that that state of case, right? If you can't understand what it would be for the world to be that way, <coughs> you can't make the world that way. Except there are a bunch of things that we, we do without understanding what it is we're doing, right? And we can still, those are still actions. There are like, Basic activities, the fundamental stuff we do for the most part, we don't have complex theoretical understanding of, right? So there's got to be <coughs> some sort of basic practical engagement with the world, and body coping this, that, and the other, um, which is kind of the basis of practical engagement. Okay, nevertheless, right, there are certain things that we couldn't even want, right? if we weren't capable of higher level reasoning and linguistic processing, right? So the picture on the poster for the, this talk is a homemade fusion reactor, right? Like, we, like I want nuclear fusion reactors. I really want those things, right? Um, we, can't, we can't make them, right? We can't, we, can't, we, we can't yet do it, right? The thing that guides our ability to even want and pursue that technological trajectory is theoretical understanding, right? And this is this is the sort of uh, for me this is the Promethean component of desire, right? Being able to desire things that we didn't evolve to desire, right? Um, how do you think about that in functional terms? It's really tricky, right? It, in, it requires, in my opinion, this notion of self, right? And the reason is, so if you think that like the our, our complete set of commitments, right? The, the complete description of the way they think the world is, right? Um, I don't think that's realized in the brain anywhere. Right? There's, no, there's no actual kind of functional correlate of that. It's an idealization, right? Um, but you, you can think about it in, 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 in terms of this integration, right? Um, um, that requires, in principle, a kind of revisability of everything. And nothing within our sets of beliefs or none of our concepts has to be completely beyond revision, right, in order to have proper in principle rationality. The same applies to our picture of the way the world should be, right, our practical commitments, right. Again, I don't think we have a complete picture of the way in which we think the world, like we don't have a complete picture of our <coughs> fundamental projects and all the different things we're doing. It's this thing which is stitched together on a continuing basis, but crucially, it has to be completely revisable, right? Um, so that means we can't think of, and this is why I resist like preference maximization as a way of thinking about reason, because in rational choice theory, you think about a rational agent as just having a set of preferences and they're given in advance. And to be honest, for the most part, we just don't know what we want. Like we have like kind of preferences, but but actually what we're more interested in is finding out what we want and developing what we want and changing. So. The crucial functional question for me, coming out of this relation between theoretical and practical reason, wants to understand the, the complexities of, of thinking about models of local, global integration of commitments and things like this, right, is, is this question of design, right? Um, how do we think about functionally describing something that can have 
you are still up, up in the No, I'm not going to I've thought that's about that. I can say one final thing, because it does connect with Nick Land. Okay. Right, insofar as, so like, the way in which you can think about sort of CCRU era accelerationism, the difference between that and, I mean, there are various ways of thinking about that and left accelerationism as it, as it consists today. There are all sorts of differences, right? But one of the most interesting is, is on the question of desire mm. and selfhood, mm. right? Personally, I think Nick Land has a very, very weak conception of desire, and it leads pretty much to everything else. Mm. I mean, it's also a fatalist, like an arch fatalist. But, um, so there's a crucial revision of the notion of desire. But what's at the heart of this is a, 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 re, um, a re appraisal of the notion of selfhood. So in, in Land's work, yeah. self, it's about like self annihilation, yeah. right? Kind of completely getting rid of the self. Whereas this is, this is the real interest of Reza Negrostani's work. Re Reza is the person who really brought back the importance of the notion of the self. We, we, we can't simply think about self annihilation, it's about self transformation. Describing it in terms, I mean, obviously, when we talk about neoliberalism as a, like an extant situation, right, rather than like the neoliberal doctrine, we we get into a bunch of different problems, right. But I think you're better off thinking about it in terms of fatalism and messianism. So, end of history, Francis Fukuyama, right, fatalism of a certain, well, no, sorry, messianism rather, right. It's like uh, you know, there's just going to be markets forever, and it's great. Right, it will bring us all of this wonderful stuff because that's what markets do. Right, whereas there is the alternative, which comes in after. That's the fatalism. Like, look, this is just it, guys. We've yeah. just got to accept markets the best we can do. Right, and I, I don't think neoliberalism can or should be thought of as a Promethean project because precisely it is ideologically about about um, ignoring collectivity. Collectivity is something to be dealt with. To be suppressed, right? It's 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 never about um, it's never about collective emancipation in the the full blooded sense of Prometheanism. So necessarily, Prometheanism contains collectivism. Yeah, this is why Prometheus <coughs> is the important figure, right? From from coming out of Romanticism, right? Because prior to that, we had Lucifer from Milton, right? Um, and you know, he's the, he's rebellion. He's rebellion against God, right? But but as a symbol of rebellion, he is crucially individualist, right? The reason Prometheus is, is is seized upon as a symbol is that he is fighting for humanity as a whole versus Zeus, right? So Prometheus. I mean, I I, I specified this by by stipulating collective emancipation here, yeah. but that's in the symbolism. Thank you.